So my name's Nikki. I am from Phoenix. I was born and raised there. Uh, I did make this trip out to Philly just to be here. This is my first WordCamp talk. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it is my fourth WordCamp. My first WordCamp was in Phoenix in 2012, wearing the shirt, uh, repping. Um, it's my first trip away from home since I had my uh, daughter. Oh, looks like I lost internet connection. Cool, bear with me. Oh, there we go. There's my daughter. Her name's Winnie. She's 16 months. Um, and yeah, so this is my first trip away from her, so you're gonna see a couple pictures of her. Um, I've got over a decade of experience in marketing, spanning from graphic design, conversion copywriting, website optimization, event planning, but I love email and marketing automation the most uh, because of all the data that you can collect on the back end. You have a relationship with your user's engagement that you don't have in a lot of other places, and you had it before in email marketing, you had it before social. Um, I already said that's my fourth WordCamp. I am, oh, after my first WordCamp, this is my first uh, WordPress website, uh, was for my swim lesson business. And uh, the other thing, the other reason I chose to come to Philly is because my little brother lives here. He works for OSIsoft, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, this is something that I made for him on his 19th birthday. Uh, so don't show him or tell him that I used that. So let's uh, get into the agenda here. Uh, we're going to talk about why is email awesome, why is email insecure, how we can be better, um, how you can prevent spoofing, and then we're going to talk a little bit about segmentation and automation, and I'll show you a couple cool tools that I like. I'm not going to get deep into the tools, just going to tell you which ones that I like and recommend if you're new to this. So why is email awesome? I'm going to throw out some stats here. There are 3.7 billion global email users as of 2017. There are 269 billion business and consumer emails sent daily. And we've got some average stats here. You've got an open rate right under 25%, CTR right over 4%. And if you've not ever seen CTOR, that is a click to open rate. It's better statistic to give you an idea of what your actual engagement is on your uh, copy within your email. And what it does is it removes all of the people who didn't open your email so you have an idea of what's working. So how you get that is you just take your clicks over your actual opens. So it's right under 12% for an average. Um, these are results across all email campaigns in all industries, so this isn't just straight marketing emails, and different industries are going to have different averages. So there's some industries that you know the average open rate is 15%. There's some that are going to shoot up and be 40%. So email has a median ROI of 122%. There's another stat out there that says for every dollar you spend in email, you're going to get $38 back. But what they're really talking about is marketing emails, ones that are encouraging direct sales that you can tie to that email. So when you, can, when you combine it with all other types of email, you get an ROI of 122%, which is still four times higher than any digital marketing channel. It's also 40 times more effective for new customer acquisition than Facebook or Twitter, which makes a lot of sense. You're probably not, your new customers are probably not finding you on Facebook or Twitter, but if you can get their email, you have a higher chance of converting them and acquiring them. So why is email insecure? Because of people. People make everything insecure. We are bad at passwords, we click on links, we open attachments, we send personal info through email, we don't delete things, and we access our email on public Wi-Fi. In short, we use email. So, the thing with email is to keep it accessible, there have been no significant security changes ever. Email, the first email was sent in 1968, they finally found out where that email went in 1971, and it was widely adopted in the early 90s. Nothing has ever changed about it security-wise. So email clients like Gmail and Yahoo actually do some encrypting of their traffic, but there's no, actually, there's no encryption of the emails themselves because uh, the basic protocols remain plain text, which means it's very easy to hack. 
and we have no ability to recall messages. Isn't that a bummer? Like, if, if, if we could add that, just that piece to email marketing, it would be so nice. There's so many times, especially when you're new to email marketing, that you hit the send button before you really meant to, and there's typos. So how can we be better? So I'm going to go through some different steps. First of all, passwords. Everybody knows that you're supposed to use a strong password. Mix of uppercase, lowercase, no birthdays, hometowns, anything that could be social engineered. Um, there are several clients that offer two-tier authentication, including Gmail, or you can uh, adopt like a LastPass or something like that, but you also need to change your email passwords often. And we're talking like every three months. Set a reminder in your phone to do it. I have a real hard time with this, um, and you really shouldn't use the same emails or the same passwords over and over again across different platforms. So when it's social engineered one place, they're going to take that password and your login information and run it through bots and try it all, all over the place again. So especially if it's in your bank. Definitely different email and bank passwords. So when it comes to attachments, use a multivirus scanner and scan every attachment before you open. I would recommend, I believe it's called Bit. I have it in my notes here, which have decided Bitdefender. Do, do, do. Yep, Bit, Bitdefender um, is a multi antivirus scanner that you can put. Um, so, what that's going to do is scan every attachment before you open it. Uh, you want to convert your email attachments to PDF. PDFs compress really nicely and they have their own encryption and a lot of different readers can easily tell if they've been manipulated and corrupted. And you wanna block emails with many recipients and large attachments. Most clients are going to automatically do this, or you can go into the settings and make that adjustment. And if you don't know the sender, don't open the attachment. You can open the email, don't open the attachment. And don't attach if you can link instead. So if you can put a document somewhere on the internet and provide them a link, like a Google Doc, it is better than attaching the Google Doc. When it comes to content, you wanna check for confidential content. Now, of course this applies to your own confidential content, but when you're dealing with customers, it's even more important. So you're gonna omit any kind of personal information, including full shipping addresses, phone numbers, and payment details is a big one. People will send you their credit card number over an email. That's not a good thing. You probably don't even want to send full invoice information. If you can redact that sensitive information out of an invoice to send it over, over email, that's the best way to go. Or have it like housed somewhere else and send them a link to it. And then you can add legal footers. Yes, nobody reads them until you have a court case where somebody needs to read them. And then watch out for phishing. We all know what phishing is, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, when it comes to your own behavior, you want to archive your email. So I do a monthly practice where I go back in and highlight all of the month's emails and throw them into an archive. I can still search them, but they're not as easily available to people who might uh, have malintent and access to my email. Um, never access emails from public Wi-Fi. I know everybody has to do this once in a while, but especially when it comes to company emails or business emails, client emails, uh, use a VPN when available, uh, hop off the Wi-Fi, use your 4G. Never click unsubscribe links in spam. So you might think you're unsubscribing, and in a lot of cases, you're just opting in for more spam. Use reply all with extreme caution. So when you reply all, you can reveal other people's email addresses to people with malintent. So the rule of thumb is if you don't know everybody on the reply all, don't. Just don't. Don't share passwords and encrypt if you can. Encryption's a complicated process. There are tools out there to help you. And because I don't have all the time in the world, I would say Google how to encrypt my email if that's something important to you. So when we do better, we can be better. But the biggest takeaway I would like you to have from this talk is to stop sending marketing emails from your Gmail. You need to invest in appropriate software. You will thank me for it later. You have templates. You have ability to see open rates and click rates. It's worth it. So to use, use a reputable email service provider, that's like a MailChimp 
or an active campaign. And when you do send email from a domain other than your own, you cannot authenticate yourself. So that's the biggest thing. Um, we're going to be talking about email authentication right now. So when I say don't get spoofed, spoofing is the act of somebody taking, trying to look a lot like you when they send an email. So a lot of spammers do this. You've probably seen the Amazon spoof email. There's phishing attached to it. It might be phishing, spam, and spoofing all at the same time. But there are different email authentication protocols in place to help you. They aren't perfect because email is just generally insecure, but uh, they are one is very easy to accomplish and then the others take a little bit more time, which is why I recommend using an ESP because they usually have uh, a platform in place that can easily get you set up on this. So SPF is your sender policy framework. And what that is, is a record that holds your domain, your brand, and your email server IP. So if you're with an ESP, if you're not sending a ton of emails, you probably don't have a dedicated server, you're on a shared server, and they can give you that IP address. And what it does is creates that record for the email clients to look up to say, okay, this email came from this IP, it should be regarding this domain, and I'm going to actually deliver it to the inbox. If it can't authenticate that record, chances are you might not make it to your customer's inbox. DKIM is Domain Keys Identification Mail. So what this allows people to do is take responsibility for transmitting a message in a way that can be verified by mailbox providers. Short story, it is a signature added to your header, your footer, or your body that will deny authentication if an edit has been made to the header, footer, or body. So think when you forward an email, there's usually something tagged at the top that says forwarded from Yahoo. That would make it fail the DCAM authentica authentication because something has been changed. So when people are trying to copy and paste your headers, chances are they're going to change something and that signature won't come with it and it will fail authentication. And the third is DMARC, which is domain-based message authentication reporting and conformance. So what DMARC does is marries SPF and DCAM together. So they're going to be checking each other's records and working together. Now, like I said before, these aren't perfect, but it's the best we have right now. So now we're gonna move on into segmentation and automation. Who here is using any kind of marketing automation? Cool. So, segmentation first. Marketers have witnessed an increase of 760% in email revenue from segmented campaigns. And segmented email campaigns get 14.31 more opens and 100.95% more clicks than non-segmented campaigns. So I've provided uh, 10 data points that you can segment by. So segmenting, in order to segment, you have to have more data about your contacts. So the more data that you can collect from them over time and over your relationship with them, the easier it's going to be for you to segment. And these are a couple things that you can use to segment by. I have a list of different demographics and they are in my notes. Get there, do, do. So demographics could include industry, job functions, seniority, basically who they are, and then your geographics are gonna be where they are. And the last eight are about what they've been up to. So engagement, how are they engaging with your brand? Are they liking things on social? Have they clicked on a link in a previous email? What do you know about them from their behavior? Um, website behavior, are they downloading content off of your website? Are they clicking to a page? Are they completing forms? Usage has to do with like if you're a software company, you have some information about when their last login might have been onto your software or if they've gone to the FAQ or help section or, or submitted a support ticket. Um, if you do any kind of survey, surveying of your customers, survey results, so like think um, like a net promoter score might be a way to create a segment. Um, seven, eight, and nine are all about 
uh, what they're buying. So when was the last time they bought? How much did they spend? How frequently do they buy? And then 10 is their stage in the life cycle. So are they a uh, prospect? Are they a hot lead? Do you think they're about to convert? Did they just convert? Where in the onboarding process are they? Uh, do they look like they are about to churn? Um, you can predict churn by collecting data off of your customers, of course, then you have to let some of them churn. Um, so, automation. Segmenting comes before automation because you need, an, you need a segment to set up a good automation. And an automation is usually, an automation is just a triggered campaign uh, that means that the segment has qualified for some event. Maybe they completed a form. Maybe they just made a purchase. Maybe they were going to make a purchase and they bounced off. But automated messages receive, on average, 70.5% higher open rates and 152% higher CTR. So once they've qualified to get into that automation, you're going to have higher engagement because the message is customized based off of their actions. So here's a couple different trigger ideas for you. Uh, content downloads, welcomes, that could be a subscriber welcome or a welcome after a purchase. A free trial upsell, if you're doing any kind of free trials, uh, you usually have some testing to figure out when you should trigger them to upsell or a low barrier product that you can get them in on, trying to get them to spend a little bit of money. Cart abandonments, purchases, onboarding, birthdays and anniversaries, and that can be their actual birthdays and anniversaries or like an anniversary of when they became a customer. Renewals and reminders, unsubscribes, and my favorite is win back because you can usually have a lot of fun with it. Uh, you can change up your copy a little bit. These are customers that have recently left, so you know, it's, it's a last ditch Hail Mary effort. My last win back campaign uh, included one that was about superheroes and another one that was, uh, don't go, uh, it's dangerous to go alone, here take this. So, uh, Zelda reference. So, uh, in addition to email marketing and marketing automation, I really love flow charts. <laughs> uh, I could spend a day in Lucid charts doing something like this, but this is a general content download automation. And you can, you can take them in different directions based off of whether they opened or clicked something. So this has to do with if they opened or not. And in a lot of cases, you can resend the same email if they don't open with a different subject line. See if they open that one. So these are all gonna be available, but person downloads your contents or subscribes to content on your website and you send them an email that delivers that content. Do they open it? Yes or no? Let's just say yes. So they opened it, the next email they get is going to be similar content in another email. Did they open it? Let's say no, they didn't open this one. So then they go into the similar content via email with a new subject line, and they open that one. So then they come back up into week three again, and you give a free trial invitation email. And they don't activate. So you send that one again with a new subject line. And turns out that got them, they activated, bring them up to the trial, onboarding, and upsell automation. So then are they gonna purchase? Yes, no. Obviously this one's really simple, but it kind of gets you starting to think about the different actions people can take along a drip campaign and how you are going to respond your messaging to their actions. So, there's lots of cool tools out there to help you be successful in email marketing and marketing automation, and they have security features already built in. So my favorite is actually Active Campaign because they are continuously developing that, and it's got some really nice automation, um, building uh, WYSIWYGs within it that lets you uh, create all these dependencies based off of their actions. Campaign Monitor is also a nice one. They both start at $9 a month. And then if you're really brand new, MailChimp has lovely integrations with WordPress and it starts free. Anybody using MailChimp in here? You like it? Yeah, it's pretty good. 
And they've even got a, so if you, if you make the step up and you start doing transactional emails and a lot of emails, they have, uh, can't remember the name, it's another monkey that helps you send transactional emails. Um, I just came out of an environment where I was using Acton and SendGrid, and I would have loved to only have one platform, but SendGrid was deeply integrated into our admin software at SiteLock, and Acton did all the automation pieces. And I'm moving into a situation where I'll be using Marketo. So another thing that we need to do more of with our email marketing is testing to see what it looks like in different email clients on different devices. So there's two big ones out there, and obviously they're much different in price, but Litmus offers a lot of great tools for testing. You can see it on different devices in their WYSIWYG, but what they're doing is they have a full seed list and they send that out to test themselves. And then Email on Acid does the same thing, they just have a few fewer features. Is anybody else here using a tool in email marketing that they absolutely love and would like to share? ConvertKit? What do you like about ConvertKit? Yeah. I always think of MailChimp as like the beginner ESP. Uh, when you really want to get into automations, you need marketing automation. And I, I know most of us can't afford Marketo or Pardot or even Acton, which is a pretty affordable uh, entry level marketing automation, which is why I think Active Campaign is so cool. Um, the one thing, Jerry and I were speaking about that earlier, is that they don't have the best support. Um, all their support is basically done via email. You can't get on the phone with anybody. Questions? Jerry. Um, to, um, to correctly get a, a subscriber, let's say, for example, uh, if subscriber opt in, mm -hmm. it's not a contact form, that's what they, mm -hmm. they choose or they don't. What about, um, I'll give you an example. I have like a huge uh, collection of business cards, mm -hmm. thousands of business cards. And I'd like to get some insults sold something like, I'd like to have them be subscribers. So, can I write to them and say, hey, I've added you to my list, tell me if you don't want to be, or should I say, hey, let me know if you want to be? What I think that's a great practice. I think sending them an email with an, uh, an option to opt in, maybe a personal email with like a link back to your opt-in form that will automatically put them into your list. I wouldn't say just add them straight to your list, especially if you're dealing with anybody outside of the United States. So Canada has some stronger laws against spam and uh, the G GDPR rolled out earlier in April, and that one's big in Europe. And if you, if they didn't explicitly opt in, they can, you can be hit with different fines that come out of there. So what I would do is maybe send them a personal email with a link to your opt-in and say, hey, these are the kind of emails you can expect from me. I'd love to have you blah, 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 blah. Email with a link to opt-in? Yes. Email them with a link to opt-in. A lot of different clients are now doing double opt-in, which is a really great, like, it will shrink your list, but you will have a far higher engaged list because they all said, yes, I want to be in, and you ask them again, are you sure? And they said, uh, yeah. So <laughs> the more you ask them, the better it is. I'll get you next. We had a question over there. Mm-hmm. Yes, so they are triggered by, um, in, in most ESPs, when they hit an unsubscribe, they're going to come up with an unsubscribe um, button. Now, that's unsubscribing from your email. Say they like unsubscribed from another email or another list, you can send them an email, or when they hit unsubscribe, you can send them, sorry to see you go, uh, and try to get like a survey response out of them to see maybe why they unsubscribed. A lot of ESPs actually have a little survey at the end that says, oh, I didn't sign up for this, or uh, you sent me too many emails, or this wasn't the email that I was expecting. Um, 
But use that information and you can segment by that or you can send a personal email outside of the ESP if it was somebody that you like know personally and have a history with. Um, and then win back, once they've canceled with you or you've lost them as a customer um, and they haven't unsubscribed from your ESP, you can send them a series of emails, like a deal, like a swinging deal to get them back to subscribe into your services. Does that answer your question? Okay, 10 minutes. Okay, I did see one over there. You still got a question, or are you gonna come here? <laughs> that means you've got spoofed. So when you get an email from yourself, um, usually what they did is they found your email somewhere and they're trying to send an email that looks a lot like yours and trying to get people to, it's usually a phishing scam. They're trying to get you to click and submit more information. There's Ignore it, delete it. You can look at it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't interact with it. So when you get a spam email, you don't want to hit the unsubscribe link because in a lot of cases, that's a malicious link. It's going to take you somewhere, possibly opt you in for more spam or download viruses onto your hardware. Yes. Yes. You can unsubscribe. Now, if it's a legitimate person sending a personal email from their personal email account, you usually can't unsubscribe. Um, one of the tricks in email marketing is to make your emails look like they came from a real person, but you can usually tell if it was uh, sent from an ESP or from somebody's actual you know, personal email box if it's got the unsubscribe. So, Jerry? Uh, a lot of, um Email providers have the option that, that will allow you to see if someone's opened your email. Mm -hmm. um, are there um, filters like you mentioned earlier, or like the uh, spam filters? Can that be detected? Will some people be able to filter out emails that are sent that have a spam filter on the So, a lot of the clients are going to filter certain emails into you know, your promotions um, based off of some of that information. But it's not going to filter because it knows it's coming from an ESP. In most cases, your ESP is going to have you on a shared server that they're responsible for the deliverability of that comes from that server. So say MailChimp has you on a shared server and somebody else on your shared server starts spamming, they're going to take the necessary actions to remove them from that server so they don't damage the deliverability of everybody else on that server. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody else? You put up a flow chart. Before. Yeah. Will, will campaign or campaign work that, work so that? some of them have more of a visual kind of build out when you do your automations and some don't. No, that's not what I meant. Well, create the so flow chart? The flow. No, this flow chart was created in Lucid charts. No, that's, that's still not what I meant. Okay. <laughs> Get, you have a mm -hmm. Can I automate that process? Yes. Through, through yes. One of those? Active campaign is going to be a little bit more sophisticated, in my opinion. Campaign monitor is still building their automations up a little bit. But yes, active campaign has this available, and it's a very nice visual WYSIWYG. Any last questions? Two email testing tools you mentioned, Litmus, and Litmus and email on acid. I like email on acid a lot. Back to the automation. Um, yes. So you don't want to build automations that you don't have a good segmented group for because the time it takes to build out the automation is maybe not the best use of your time if you have a small group. Um, something like this would probably take me a couple hours um, to build the automation itself, and that's not considering copywriting or email design time. In most cases, I'm in a marketing department where that's done for me, and I build the automation itself. And then you're going to want to test your automations. You send it to a couple people, and you can um, expedite them through the next steps. Like if there's a wait, you can expedite it to make sure that they're getting the right emails based off of their behaviors. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about that. That's, that's the, you just said you sent it to a couple of people, but 
Yes. So the testing that I was, yeah, so the testing that I was talking about is really about a visual test of it. It's not going to test out your automations. It's going to tell you what your emails look like on different clients depending on what device they're on. Um, a client complained to me, uh, his client list is getting emails from an employee. Huh. Yes. So they've been they've the been thing, spoofed. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I could tell them was make sure you change all your passwords. Yes. So I had a conversation last night at the speaker and sponsor dinner uh, with a gentleman, and he was saying he had a client that was sending emails from the same server he was hosting his domain on, and didn't believe that that was affecting the speed of his site, and it was it was basically taking up bandwidth. So he had them move over to SendGrid and watched it go from night to day with the, the resources that were available to run his website because he was constantly crashing his website. He'd send hundreds of emails in a matter of hours from the same server, which is another reason why we highly recommend ESPs, email service providers, uh, and, and use their servers. They manage them for deliverability. It's mostly manual. It's mostly manual. I think there's some tools that like you can take pictures of business cards, but they're not perfect. Yeah. Hire like a college student. <laughs> there's people looking for that kind of work, go on Fiverr. You know, as long as like the information that you're giving them to input, like that you trust them with it and that they're not gonna do something insecure with it. Uh, we got to wrap up here. I want to thank everybody for bearing with me on my talk when I gimped out. And I hope you guys have a great word camp.